Thank you for joining us today. I'm Neha Upadhyay, and I'm a Wharton MBA candidate. I'm delighted to represent my research team today. Our motivating question really came from this community. We increasingly received questions from practitioners about how they could build up people analytics functions within their own organizations. And through the last few years, our research has evolved from this starting point to the motivating question you see behind me. What allows people analytics organizations to thrive? Today's presentation, uh, or from this motivating question, we took a two-fold research approach. We conducted qualitative interviews to hear from 30 existing people analytics professionals across team sizes, industries, and maturity levels. And we also conducted quantitative research, uh, deploying a survey in pe across people analytics professionals in industry. In fact, some of you may have participated in the interviews or the surveys, and for that, we'd like to say thank you. From the synthesis of these two sources, as well as our learnings from reviewing existing literature, we developed a series of findings. And that brings us to today. We're excited to share our preliminary findings, and we'll be focusing on the characteristics of people analytics teams and compare high and low impact teams using a metric that we derived by asking survey respondents to report how impactful they believe their teams to be. When we began our exploration of the data, we really focused on the characteristics of the people analytics team itself. But what we found is that for so many teams, what really matters lies outside of the team as well. Another way to think about this is in terms of a people analytics team's aim to influence outside business areas. So much of what matters is outward facing. To that end, we'll share our findings today, starting with an exploration of some of those internal factors, and then shift to looking at some of the organizational context that really drives impact for a people analytics team. Starting with the team itself, when we interviewed and surveyed organizations, we found that there are a number of roles correlated with impact and commonly represented on people analytics teams. And there are two main buckets to these roles, subject matter experts and technical experts. What we saw is that the most impactful teams captured the diversity of these roles. They had significant representation from both groups, ultimately striking a balance between subject matter expertise and technical expertise. And for many teams, consultants and data scientists were the two roles most correlated with impact across these two buckets. At this point, I want to recognize that this is the 11th year of this conference. 11 years ago, people analytics was much newer, and people analytics leaders were largely coming from other business areas, defining their roles and functions from the ground up. Today, 50% of people analytics teams surveyed reported having people analytics leaders with prior people analytics experience. And 11 years ago, this stat would have been unimaginable. However, we're now seeing people analytics teams building their benches. In fact, by virtue of being in this room and having conversations like these, the people here are helping to build that bench. Now, people analytics is still an area that's continuing to develop, but we have so many more people today cultivating this shared knowledge. Rounding off our findings related to teams, as we dug into the data, we also explored how team size might drive impact for an organization. First and foremost, we see that 100% of, of the bottom 20th percentile of teams had headcounts between one and five people. In general, larger teams were higher impact teams, but it was still possible for smaller teams to be impactful. Around 40% of the highest impact teams had fewer than 20 people. Now, let's shift to discussing some of the organizational context of people analytics teams. Starting with org design, we see very few teams are decentralized and no high impact teams were trying decentralized structures. In exploring why this might be so common, we turn to our interviews. Time and time again, we heard people analytics professionals share the benefits of a more centralized or hybrid approach, particularly focusing on resource pooling, knowledge sharing, and centralized reputation building. All of these together can have a sort of multiplicative effect, allowing a people analytics team to more effectively spin up and drive impact. However, there is something lost with a centralized structure. 
a decentralized structure where people analytics practitioners sit directly within the business areas they are serving by nature facilitates greater business specific knowledge and relationship building. In the absence of this, people analytics teams trying a centralized or hybrid approach need to focus on building active and meaningful partnerships with the business areas they serve. These people analytics teams adopt a bit of a consultative model. They invest in relationships across the organization to build business specific knowledge that is critical to their operations. As a result of these relationships, people analytics teams are able to source problem statements and in turn provide business relevant reports, products and services back to their client business areas. Now we might expect that as a people analytics team grows in its impact, it may source fewer problem statements externally, instead focusing on generating all of its own problem statements. And while it's true that higher impact teams do generate some of their own problem statements, we found that those high impact teams actually still continue to uh, source problem statements externally. Essentially, high impact teams didn't move away from sourcing problem statements from their clients, their capacity to address problem statements simply grew. We had a similar finding when it came to the types of reports, products, and services that people analytics teams offered to their client business areas. The lowest impact teams focused almost entirely on building interactive dashboards and static reports. As we moved up the impact spectrum, we found that the higher impact teams were still continuing to build these interactive dashboards and static reports, actually to a greater degree than their low impact counterpart. However, they were also exploring other deliverables as well, particularly predictive analytics tools and homegrown software products. When we consider the clients who are receiving these reports, perhaps unsurprisingly, HR is a major client organization for the lowest and highest impact teams. However, when we look outside of HR, we see that the lowest impact teams only have a handful of functions they tend to serve, whereas the highest impact teams tend to serve across functions in the organization. Finally, let's shift to talking about people analytics enablers. We find that the highest impact people analytics teams are bolstered by a culture of data-driven decision-making and strong advocate relationships. When we talk about culture, we mean an organizational culture of making data-driven decisions. We found that high impact teams reported working with leaders who asked for data before they made decisions. Further, this culture of data-driven decision-making was correlated with greater data governance and access, both of which together enabled people analytics teams to act responsively to their client business areas. When we talk about advocacy, we mean non HR and non people analytics advocates throughout the organization. In particular, CEO support is important when it comes to advocacy. In fact, all of the highest impact teams reported that their CEO was one of their strongest advocates. Advocacy can also be incredibly important in organizations that do not already have this culture of data-driven decision-making, as leaders can model the value of making data-driven decisions for their business areas. As I conclude, I'd like to come back to this framework from earlier. The factors that enable people analytics teams to drive impact come both from the internal characteristics of the people analytics team, as well as the organizational context that the people analytics team operates within. With that in mind, we have several questions that you can consider as you leave this conference. The first set is about the people analytics team itself. Where might you not be capturing the diversity of different roles within your team? Where might there be an imbalance between technical and subject matter expertise? And how can you address this imbalance? Our next set of questions is about fostering relationships with client business areas. Who else should your people analytics function be partnering with across the organization? Who might already be receptive to this type of partnership? And who might not be receptive, but has a lot to gain from people analytics partnership? Our last set of questions is about finding advocates. What is the current state of executive advocacy for people analytics? Who are the important advocates that People Analytics does not yet have access to? And how can People Analytics foster those critical relationships? With that said, I'd like to thank you all for joining today. 
this presentation really is the culmination of work stemming directly from this community. And I speak on behalf of my team when I say that we are incredibly excited to see how these conversations continue to evolve.